Good afternoon, everyone. This is our Tuesday, June 11th. I guess my wrong agenda here. June 11th uh, work session for Board of County Commissioners. And next on the agenda, or first on the agenda, is a landfill programs update and recycling discussion with Kathy Hall, our new solid waste <coughs> manager. Welcome. And Brian Pettit, our public works director. Great. Well, thanks for the introduction. Uh, we are here to talk about the landfill and more specifically the recycling program at the landfill. Uh, but first we want to do an overview of the programs we have at the landfill and, and give the board a schedule on it when they'll be coming back. I want to start off by saying the landfill in the Solid Waste Center, it, it's successful and has been for years. It's just time to take a really a fresh perspective on our programs. Uh, our diversion rates are exceeding 60% and we have extended landfill life because of the programs we have in place and because of operational changes. Uh, really, Kathy and I are here to, to talk about the future of the landfill and programs uh, from a resource recovery standpoint. Uh, just to talk a little bit about the programs with regard to, uh, we have a, a fiber a recycling program, which is cardboard and paper. We uh, recycle our commingle products that people typically think about when they think about recycling, aluminum, plastic, and glass. Um, we have an electronics recycling program, uh, Household Hazardous Waste, which is hugely successful, and we are analyzing its uh, operational uh, vitality right now. We recycle latex paint, and we've recently had some changes in that program. Uh, Green and Food Waste is really an upcoming pro uh, program that is growing as we speak, and hopefully uh, we'll be looking at changes there. Aggregate crushing, uh, we crushed over 90,000 tons of product over the last six months, and we hope to sell a lot of that this summer. Uh, and then finally, we uh, hopefully we'll be looking at uh, uh, wastewater and, and having a small treatment facility at the landfill in the future. So. I want to really give you an overview of those programs because we have a huge diversity of recycling programs at the landfill and, uh, and they are successful. So kicking it off and moving forward, uh, what we'd like to talk about is a schedule to bring four of those programs to the Board of County Commissioners in the future. First and foremost is a wastewater uh, treatment system proposal, which we hope to bring back to you in the fall. And this would uh, hopefully treat up to 1.5 to 2 million gallons of septage that currently has to be shipped a great distance away from uh, the county. But this would take a, a large capital expense and would uh, impact our operations. So we'll be bringing that to you in the future. Uh, food waste is becoming more and more popular and we, uh, we are composting this as today and in the future, but there's a new way we could do business and we'd like to bring that back as well. Household hazardous waste is uh, largely used by our residents here and uh, I think is in need of a little bit of a facelift. And so that program will be brought back to the board. Uh, finally, and probably most importantly, our landfill contract with uh, Heartland is going to expire in the next couple of years. And we would like to bring that back to the Board of County Commissioners to determine uh, the next steps uh, once that contract expires. But really, the focus of today is our recycling program. It's a place where we could see the, the most bang for the buck and uh, is one of our biggest expenditures at the landfill. So with that, I'll kick it to Kathy, and she can go through our current program and what our alternatives are. Okay. Um, so as I, I first started, that was one of the biggest initiatives that was brought to me um, kind of looking at the recycling program, looking at the cost of the recycling program, and just kind of finding alternatives. Uh, do we leave it as is? Do we put fees in place? Do we put some more burden on the haulers to take care of the recycling? So currently right now, as Brian mentioned, we recycle fiber, which is the cardboard, uh, newspaper, office paper, magazines, um, and some various other papers. Uh, we also do co-mingle, which is your number one through seven plastics, glass bottles, metal containers. Uh, the fiber program, we generally make money on or break even. We bail it on site at the landfill, and then we work with our broker or hauler, which is waste management, and they send it to markets, and depending on the market conditions, very volatile at times, we get paid for that. The commingle, on the other hand, uh, we collect at the landfill. We also collect it at 
Aspen Rio Grande of uh, basalt, and then we do a Bible and Flea collection at Redstone. And then we also collect it at the landfill. People can drop off at the landfill. Uh, we take that in. We pay a hauler to ship it to Eagle, the Eagle County Materials Recovery Facility. And it's all at a cost. We receive no revenue from that. And on the graph, you can see we did an analysis of the cost. Uh, you can see the tons that we've taken in since 2006, I believe, uh, through last year, 2012. Uh, you see there's, it has been a decline, and we can discuss, I will discuss the reasons for that later and the amounts that we're getting. The bottom graph in 2010, we did start collecting a $25 per ton uh, disposal or drop-off fee for the major haulers to deliver the materials to the landfill. And then there, again, 2010, there was a sharp decline. Uh, about the time 2010 rolled around, waste management opened a single stream materials recovery facility in Grand Junction. So they stopped bringing their materials to us and they hauled directly there. Uh, MRI still brings some materials to us as well as the small haulers. Intermountain uh, completely avoids us and takes all their material to Denver at Alpine Recycling. So that can kind of give you a reason why there was such a decline. Uh, so as you were looking at some of our, you know, we're suffering significant losses in our commingle program. Uh, last year, but last year it was around three hundred and fifty thousand dollars, three hundred thousand dollars that it cost us to recycle the materials. As again, commingle we receive no revenue from, and we have to pay to haul it to Eagle, where they sell it. So we need to evaluate the program. Since 1991, we put a hauler ordinance in place, the county did, and it's remained relatively unchanged for the, over two decades. We've gone by the system of convenience center drop-offs, drop-off at the landfill, and then hauling it to a materials recovery facility. So, you know, looking at those significant losses, is there a way to do it better? Uh, do we, you know, we're going to open it up to the board. How do they want to proceed? Leave it the same? Institute fees, put more burden on the haulers to haul directly to the materials recovery facility. So we're just going to, reason for this is to open up that discussion. Okay. Rob? I think the first question I have is, is crying through what you were talking about. You kept on measuring this program is really successful. How do we measure success? I mean, because that could be a lot of different things. I mean, you said the uh, electronics or... Uh, called it something different, um, was very successful. Is it successful because it's funding the other programs, or is it successful because we're keeping it out of the landfill? Is it successful because we're saving the environment? Is it successful because we're finding a way to recycle some of the materials? I don't know what, I don't know what success means well, it's, as you're talking about this, and it really relates to what you're talking about how do we revamp this to be more successful? Well, how do we define success? You know, is it bottom line? I'm a business owner, so for me, <laughs> you know, my business bottom line is success, but there are other measures of success sure. specifically in this for what we want to accomplish. And I think this kicks off where we want to go, which is really to determine the vision of what this board would see as defining success in the future for recycling. Because what I am, I guess defining a success is two decades old of basically diverting waste from our waste stream and saving landfill life. That's what past boards have defined as success. That was their vision. So from that standpoint, we are successful. I think where our discussion needs to go to a higher level is determining what's going to be successful in the future and what's that vision look like so that we can know whether we're meeting the, the needs of this board and, and our program to determine whether it's successful or not. We're successful based on a historic mode of operation. And I guess the way I would tackle this issue is come up with, because there's several measures of success, and you can't just say we're only looking at one, but you come up with the five measures of success and you weigh them on you know priorities and this and that. And 
it's a great first discussion with some of this material of where we are now, but your the next discussion needs to be, you know, what's the overall finances of of the landfill because you know, this trash <laughs> dumping helps support this and you know where what are the other pieces that we can manipulate from a financial standpoint? Those sorts of things, and then what are the the long term statistics of getting people to use less? I mean, such as the Aspen bag um, band, you know, things like that. I mean, are there are there other things that we can do from a policy setting point of view as a government to lower the use of the landfill? And the landfill longevity, I think, from my understanding of looking back at this issue over the years. The, land, uh, the landfill longevity has a big cost issue to it, too, because there is a ticking time bomb at the end when the landfill can no longer be used, and then there's a huge expense to find another place, to ship somewhere else, to whatever. So, mm -hmm. But it's, it's a matter of looking at all those different pieces for success. I want to just back up for a second. Uh, some of the numbers you gave us, Kathy, you said it, it, it cost us about three hundred thousand uh, dollars to offset the commingle, a part of the recycling program. Uh, but we break even, or we actually make some money on the fibrous materials. Depending on the market, yeah. So some of that can be used to offset the the uh, cost of the commingling part of it. We don't know that what that number is. It's, around 100,000 or? Yeah. yeah, George, the numbers are so close. We almost break even on the fiber because you have a cost and a revenue component to it. So we're not really losing. And sometimes we're, we're making a little bit of money. And so when money is being made, that can be used to offset. But the <clears throat> gap on the co-mingled is so large. You know, and historically what we've really used is tipping fees um, for the landfill. To, to cover that gap. And when, um, particularly when we were in a high growth period and we had a lot of construction waste that was, was coming in, that was driving increase, you know, a large volume of tipping fees that we, that's really what we used to um, fund the recycling program. Since the recession, that waste stream has dropped off. And so, we don't have as much in the way of tipping fees to um, subsidize the recycling program. And we also haven't really taken a step back in a couple of decades to say, well, what's changed? Um, we know that um, waste haulers have become more aggressive in developing recycling programs. So waste management now has a program in um, Grand Junction and Eagle County has uh, developed their MRF and we've got um, haulers, you know, who are required to offer curbside recycling. Historically, um, when there weren't as many options, we created the options to process and recycle those commingled at our landfill. Um, I think there are a number of options today that weren't available maybe 20 years ago, um, for example, to use either, um, you know, to maybe have haulers, you know, require uh, that they offer curbside recycling and then they have facilities which are outside the county um, that they could bring these streams to and, and process with greater economies of scale than maybe what we're doing now, which would probably, I mean, the costs are going to have to go somewhere. So, you know, that, that would probably be a fee issue on the consumer side, but it would also reduce or eliminate the subsidy that we would have to provide for this waste stream at the landfill. And so um, today we weren't, you know, necessarily trying to get a, a specific direction, but I think, Rob, to, you know, your point, it was to open up the discussion and get an idea of what the board's vision might be and what we should do more work on to bring back to you. Um, the commingled <laughs> co waste is the area where we have the greatest gap between costs and revenues, and it is an area that, um, from a 
financial perspective is not sustainable in the long run. It's the first thing we know we need to fix in one form or another. What is not clear to us right now, and what we just wanted to generate some discussion around the you know, board's vision is you know, whether we should be looking at generating new revenues so that we can keep our existing program as it stands today. Should we be looking at alternative ways that the service could be provided in the community, for example, having, um, you know, just requiring curbside <coughs> recycling and maybe reducing the size or eliminating even a lot of our commingle program at the landfill. Um, are there other options that maybe um, we, we haven't considered that, that we should, um, that, that the board would like to know more about? So it's really just to open up that discussion today. Yeah, thank you. I, I just want to follow up on some other points. The, um, with, with those options in terms of um, recycling, I think we all believe that we, it's, it's, it's something that <coughs> we want to try to continue, whether we do it as a county or whether we uh, have the um, collectors do it. But have we, um, have we also, when we look at ideas in terms of generating additional funds for this, have we looked at partnership with some of our other municipalities and counties? So for example, Basalt, has a recycling center there. And um, actually, that recycling center not only sits in within the municipality of Basalt, but within Eagle County. And I suspect that probably more than half of the uh, users are Eagle County or Basalt residents. And, and I don't believe they contribute at all, even though eventually those commingle products end up at the Eagle Murph. Um, Redstone's not as quite this big an example, but I understand that Marble residents utilize that, so is Gunnison County willing to come, uh, come to the table, help out, to allow those programs to continue as they are, or even the city of Aspen with, with the Rio Grande. So are there opportunities or are there interest from the municipalities and counties to continue the current system? Or, or if not, then, then that tells us that perhaps we do need to look at a different direction. In the other counties or the regional area hasn't really reached out. Um, uh, you know, other areas of the country have done that. They've developed an authority in which, you know, specific, you know, if one county has a landfill and that's used, and if one county has the MRF, that's used. But, you know, we haven't really gotten anywhere close to that here. And I guess I'll address a little bit of what you're asking. You know, the city of Aspen's gone to a curbside program, and they've seen increases in their commingle rates because of that program. Uh, the town of Basalt is really struggling with uh, some of the contamination at their site. It's, prob it's, it's just a trash dump for a lot of people. And what John was alluding to a little bit is the level of redundancy. And, and actually in Basalt, there are two drop-off sites for recycling. One's owned by waste management, I believe, and then one's run by us. And so residents there have other opportunities for recycling rather than the, the county bringing that burden of handling those commingled products by itself. And so I, I, what I've heard and seen from, our, from Basalt and Aspen specifically is really to reevaluate our drop-off program and look at curbside is uh, to elevate the amount of recyclables and also do away with the unsightliness of the drop-off centers and that management problem. Yeah, right. Rachel? Uh, yeah. Um, I guess overall, this is a good document for opening the dialogue. But for me, it's very incomplete for actually giving more definitive direction. And um, I think that, you know, we really need to see written down so we can analyze them and think about them ourselves, these industry trends with our various haulers. Who are the haulers? Where are they kind of taking it to now? What has the industry trends been? And what's, you know, to the extent possible, it's driving those trends. Um, and I think it would be good to actually have a little bit of a measure from the city of what has the result of their hauler ordinance been, both in terms of customer satisfaction, what really was the cost increases, uh, I was part of the city council that passed that, and uh, it was, uh, you know, you got a certain number of scare stories about how it was going to double or triple rates, and 
other people were like, actually, it's going to reduce my rate because now I'm recycling. But it, it's essentially that when you contract for service, it's not an option. You can pay extra for recycling. It's this is your price. And if you separate out and have your recycling in this pile and your waste in this pile, you, you may end up with a lower bill because they're not doing as many pickups or the size of the container and things like that. You know, but I, again, we need to kind of have what does the city think its own results from that have been? And on the, again, from a city side, there was an important component of having the Rio Grande recycling facility because a certain number of the businesses really like to recycle themselves, their cardboard products or things like that, and literally wouldn't even have the storage in the alleys right. <laughs> for some of those products um, in the meantime. So, you know, how, how all this meshes together to me is part of weaving the appropriate solution. Um, and so that would then include either a memo or um, to the extent needed as executive session, uh, what are our powers as a home rule county of what we can put in those hauler regulations? Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, I don't know, you know, and I don't want to hazard a guess. Uh, but if the city it was, you know, clear as a home rule city they could require that there would be recyclable pickup at the same time as trash pickup from anyone who wanted to have a franchise or operate within the city. And so, you know, I have no idea what other great options are out there, um, you know, and, and what it takes to redo those is a lot of outreach and a lot of discussion, um, but that is something we need to make a decision. I, I really agree with what Rob had said in terms of identifying our five goals or ten mm -hmm. goals, whatever they are, and clearly, you know, life of the landfill is one of those, uh, you know, sustaining the community environmental ethic and supporting that is another, something we really heard heavily from those kitchen round tables, or at least the ones I was part of that people loved it, those programs. And then, you know, for me, it's just the way I think about things, but uh, it's some scenario building. If you pick this path, you know, cut haulers have to do this, it will mean that the waste flow will go in these directions to these places. Or if you pick this scenario, you know, it will require this municipal participation and we expect this outcome. But some, some kind of what, let's walk through the blocks mm -hmm. to say if we go here, what do we really think the outcome will be so we can match that outcome with the, the goals. And uh, so, you know, again, under some scenarios there might be a reduction in the materials coming to us. How will that comport with a reduction in our costs? And, and our, our service costs. So we need that's that's what I need to go forward to make a decision. And then I think I've raised it at other meetings, but again, I'm not even sure what do we have the authority to pass a, um, a bottle deposit ordinance? You know, uh, it, does that start to reduce the commingles? Does that start to um, uh, increase? The, the return rate. I, I just don't know, but uh, how are the other ways to accomplish recycling that might occur outside of our programs? And perhaps that bottle deposit, is that just something that has to be done on a statewide level? Do we need state authority or do we, can we do it locally? And um, I know the public, uh, I've heard back from people asking about, you know, the plastic bags. And I understand why we're not doing the plastic anymore, but it really just struck me as like, well, why can't we just collect in a smaller amount and take them over in the back of a pickup truck <coughs> instead of trying to wait until it's enough for a semi load. Mm -hmm. But, you know, uh, people, and I know, I feel it myself sometimes, I get the Sunday newspaper, I can recycle the newspaper, but I can't recycle the plastic bag that it came in. Mm -hmm. And and what do I do? And so I'm stockpiling them and dropping them at Denver centers when I go to Denver yeah. for yeah. business. But I, I, I hear, hear from people that they, you know, why not plastic? And, and is there a way to do that economically? I understand the, the challenge we've had with that before. But those are the types of things that I need to really be able to give you mm -hmm. good direction. Okay. Good. Thank you. Michael? Uh, Kathy O'Brien, how come, <clears throat> how come the, uh, the amount of, of uh, co-mingle and the revenues don't mirror each other exactly? <coughs> What is the what is what's going on? The market price, the market price, yeah. um, the market will vary price is the based factor. on yeah. So there's a lot of elasticity, um, and it's basically like a commodity price. Yeah. So, so as so as there's more collection of commingles, 
the commodity price goes down? Well, it, uh, just in general, it, I mean, not at our landfill. Well, you know, it, it's an international market, and right. so you've got to have the consumption side uh, on one hand, and so you can, if that consumption side goes down and the supply is up, yeah, the price is going to go down and, and vice versa. And so it depends where those two are relatively, what demand is and uh, what supply is. And so, um, and so... So then the question is, do we stockpile it and wait for the market? I mean, uh, you know, instead of just reacting as a stream, do we stockpile it and wait till the commodity prices start to go up? I guess, can, if I yeah, can, yeah, and I, and I think what John's referring to is really the fiber market. That's what we're talking about, mm -hmm. and we have done that in the past. It's hard to maintain those bales at the landfill. We don't have uh, enclosed facility to maintain them, so they get wet, they get contaminated, and we lose revenue there as well. Yeah, but um, I'm talking about the co-mingle. Well, the co-mingle, just to, just so we're clear, co-mingle is a loser altogether. We make no revenue on that. The revenue that's, yeah. that's talked about there is just a tipping fee that we instituted a couple of years right. ago. So that really is going to be static based on the amount of material that's coming to the landfill. So then, so then the goal would be to reduce commingle entirely, right? The stream to the to the landfill. That's what we're talking about, isn't it? Well, that, financials the goal. It, yeah. So, well, uh, if financials the goal, you're, you're exactly right, Michael. That if we were to collect more commingled waste, we would just lose more, more money. Um, and the inverse is true too, the, the less we collect. And so from a financial perspective, it's a little bit of, of a quandary. Now, when you have greater economies of scale, you know, presumably somebody is able to make money at this at, at some level, at some tipping point. Um, and that's why you see some of the big players in, in this business, like waste management and such. Um, certainly, we're not at that level. Um, it doesn't appear that Eagle County is at that level because we're not really receiving anything. We're just paying the, the processing and, and shipping costs and putting it there with the idea that it's you know, being recycled and, and being diverted from... So, so when we arrive at Eagle with our co um, we have an expenditure of the transport. They actually charge us a uh, processing fee? No, no, they're not charging us, but we've done work by that time to, we've, to get we've it loaded up time. and get it shipped. And yeah, we've invested time and resources. So they accept it for free? They accept it for mm -hmm. free, yeah, yeah. And then they sell it to the markets. Part of, part of our challenge is um, geographically, you know, where we sit and we're isolated. We've got to ship what are, relatively speaking, fairly limited volumes over long distances. And so financially, it's a challenge. So the, the other solution would be to try and find, is there another revenue source? And we could work it that way. And so part of the philosophical another re question. revenue so source uh, apart from the commingle. So a revenue yeah. source that we charge more for electronics or, or waste tipping or whatever, that's what you're talking about? That could be an option, or do we have fees specifically for commingled, or do we have um, a tax that supports these kind of programs, which would put our enterprise status um, in, into some jeopardy from an accounting perspective. But there's all these options we can put together Philosophically, if we kind of had an idea what you, what direction you guys are more comfortable with from a philosophical perspective, it helps us narrow the, the number of scenarios and such to put together. Well, wouldn't wouldn't the, the one of the directions be to reduce cost? I mean, isn't that a, seems to me that's that's a goal we could accept, right? So then the question is, how do we do that? We were, um, when we were looking at our master plan for the landfill a couple of years ago, we, the, part of that discussion was to look at uh, including a MRF. And, and uh, obviously at this point, it probably doesn't make sense to do that uh, because at the t at, during that same time, we knew that Eagle County was gearing up on the MRF. 
So I'm just curious, since Eagle County is not um, charging us, and they're, they're able to sell those, uh, that product, are, do we know if, if that's a sustainable program for them at this point, or are they being subsidized by the county or the taxpayers? I would, I would guess, I met with them a couple months ago. Um, feeling I got from them what they sell and they receive from their commodity markets is enough to make them break even. It keeps their operations going, but they're not certainly not making money, if much money at all. So, And so they must be looking at trying to expand uh, their reach in terms of bringing more uh, materials in to get into that economies of scale. So where would that come from? Because they're, in a sense, they're sort of isolated as well, mm -hmm. you know, in between Junction and Denver, between two large markets or and, Salt Lake. Yeah, and they're losing. I mean, waste management used to bring their material there, and then they opened their Grand Junction facility, so waste management pulled out. Um, they all Honey Wagon, which is their largest recycler that brings materials to them, wants to go single stream, but Eagle County is refusing to go single stream recycling. So they're threatening to go to Denver. And, you know. But the good news is, is that it's not that we have too few options. <laughs> to a certain degree, it's almost that <laughs> we have too many, and it's finding a way to make that sustainable and, and understand, you know, part of the discussion for you guys as we work through this, and this is probably going to take several work sessions for us to, to work through after this introduction, but is how important is it for you to maintain control of that stream of commingled from the time it's collected here till when it's dispensed um, at, at a MRF. That'll be one key question, you know, because um, one option is to, you know, if you require like the curbside recycling, which is one option that you have, um, you don't have as much control over, you know, that that stream. But you've also put the onus then on on the haulers. Um, to identify an appropriate MRF and to, to try and find those economies of scales with, with market as an incentive. Um, if it's important that we maintain that kind of control, at least to the point of where it's packaged up to be sent wherever it's going to be sent as a, as a commodity, then we probably need to retain a little bit more control uh, of this program. And we can explore those kinds of options for you, but that's one of the key key elements here is, you know, you, it, if you're going to rely on on market forces, you lose a little bit of control sometimes over what's getting recycled and not. Steve, in looking at the problem, I I looked at sort of the end product goal that we're trying to achieve, and one of those certainly would be to extend the life of our landfill by diverting material. For recycling. Another would be to recycle the maximum amount of non-renewable resources possible, which we're doing by delivering, right now, delivering the stuff to Eagle so then it gets recycled. And obviously that's costing us a lot of money to do that. Um, minimize fossil fuel consumption to accomplish the above, so we're spending a lot of diesel to smash the stuff to cart it off to Eagle. In that respect, we'd be better off just have one area of a landfill and just pile up the the co-mingled stuff for 20 years, and then it will be at some point come in and mine it because it's going to be really highly concentrated aluminum and glass mm -hmm. and materials that. <laughs> It'd be worth somebody's while to. We'd save money actually if we just store it there and don't haul it to Eagle. Just leave it there as a future mining site. So that would that would be one one way to save on our mm -hmm. fuel costs to get it over to Eagle. Um, another consideration could be to maximize the energy production from the materials. And a gentleman from waste management told me that. They are not in the waste management business, but they are in the energy business. Because on their different landfills, they're getting methane. They're maybe burning stuff to produce electricity or, you know, various things. They're trying to do it in the least 
fuel costly way possible to do all these things. So they, they consider themselves in the energy business, not in the waste business. And then the other consideration is we don't want to, um, we want to be able to continue the public's um, ethic of recycling. And I remember being in the Virgin Islands and being really frustrated that I could not recycle stuff. It's like, well, should I pack this stuff in my suitcase and bring it home to recycle it here? Because otherwise it's just going in a landfill on St. Thomas. And it gave me a really bad feeling when you're used to recycling stuff and then all of a sudden couldn't recycle it. Mm -hmm. And that would be a, you know, a mass reaction. If we all of a sudden quit recycling, people would be really right. frustrated. So balancing all of those goals is, is a tricky thing because mm -hmm. every one of them is kind of a good goal in itself. And, and I just want to be really clear, the one option we never have had on the table from a staff perspective is eliminating our recycling programs in any way versus seeing if there are alternative ways for us to deal with at least the same or even you know an expanded waste stream. Rachel? Yeah, you know, um, I think we, as we look at different options, we certainly are in a better position to talk to the city and other municipalities about uh, whether there should be some contribution to this program because we have pretty close to eliminated that landfill transfer to the general fund. And that was one of the big questions they had before was why should we contribute to this program when you transfer any, gen, you know, to, to the general fund, which was started after 9-11 or something like that. But we, we have eliminated that now. And um, it was a point that Rod made before, but as we go to these final decisions, we really do need to look at it in the, the, the long-term budget range, the closing costs and maintenance costs after the landfill, how much we need to have saved up for, for those sort of things. Um, you know, it just... I, I've said this before, but when we get to recycling, we always seem to have lost the reduce and the reuse portions of those e equations. And, and there's been more read about that nationally about consumerism and how much we consume to begin with, and are we reducing or re you know reusing. And uh, so recycling has just become, to me, a way to feel good about buying a thousand cans a year, <laughs> you know, of something, beer, beverages, iced tea, you know, whatever, and without thinking twice about how it's packaged or, or could it be packaged best. I mean, it's like we've, we've given out rebates for Energy Star refrigerators and things like that. Well, maybe we should start giving out um, rebates if people buy a soda stream machine to use at home instead of buying a six-pack of Coca-Cola every day. You know, I mean, really, is, would that be a way to reduce the, the, the uses? And so, I don't know. I'd love to see a little more discussion about reduce and reuse. And, uh, you know, I don't know what that might comport with some of the city goals as they've been working on reducing bottled water mm -hmm. consumptions and things like that. Um, so the other thing that strikes me, and I'm not sure at, at what point and how, but we should we should have some talk with some of the management of the, the haulers. And uh, we're, we're, uh, we're talking about them instead of talking with them about where their long range plans go and how we can fit into that. I mean, it, it may be that the tipping fee itself brought us some revenue. You know, maybe it should be a higher tipping fee so that more co-mingles go somewhere else where they lose money. Maybe it should be lower. I, that's what I'm saying. I need to see the scenario planning to say what we think will be the uh, equal and opposite reaction to any action we take. Well, uh, for me, uh, the status quo is not accept it's not acceptable. Um, you know, the benefits we're getting from recycling, the greening of that is a positive, but on the other side uh, is the expenditures, the greening of those dollars that's costing us uh, to run that program. So um, I think this is a good start. Um, I think you've got some ideas uh, to, to help pursue this and push this conversation to the next level. Uh, but, but, and I'm glad that we're, glad we have you on board, Kathy, mm -hmm. with some fresh eyes to, 
and with your background and experience to, to, to really uh, provide us with some options and, and with some uh, suggestions that you have seen work in other places in the country. Rachel. I'm sorry, one last thing. You know, when we talk about our goals, um, I think Steve has listed some good ones. But, you know, and, and we may not have that discussion today, maybe after we get to the other options, but, you know, we need to decide is our goal that we get this program to a zero subsidy? Or is it a $125,000 subsidy? Or is it $175,000? Is there an acceptable level of subsidy that's necessary to have a strong recycling? Or is it a zero number? I mean, we, we don't have a target, so we don't have a goal. That's a good question. Mm -hmm. It may, you know, and, and, and you do have 20 minutes, or I don't know, you know, if the, the board has some ideas about, you know, goal. general goal statements or what success would look like for you in a commingled uh, recycling program. It'd be good to have some general ideas so that we can build some scenarios um, and try and put some real numbers and, and data um, around those types of values that you want to see maintained. Yeah, I, I wonder if, um, following up on Rachel's comments, if uh, if you looked at um, curbside pickup and knowing that those vendors would probably pass on some of those costs to the consumers, um, rather than subsidizing at the landfill, if there's a possibility of some sort of rebate program for Picking County residents that may come into some level of subsidy, but it, it also addresses some other issues in terms of extending the life of the landfill and, and some of these other areas. I saw hands up, Michael, Steve. So um, so what to do with this co-mingle is really the question, right? That's the money. Can you, can you, can you crush and shred the co-mingled stuff and use it as a cover at the, at the landfill? It is, but you take away the recycling. Yeah, but it is being recycled. It's being used yeah, for I mean, purpose. Yeah. I, mean, I know in Salt Lake City, they won't, they'll take everything, but they won't take glass bottles. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, I mean, they'll take everything, but no glass bottles. So, I mean, I don't know exactly how they do it. It's a much larger volume, but even they don't take glass bottles. It costs more to recycle a glass bottle than to make a new glass bottle, so. So that's just an industry problem in general. Mm -hmm. It's heavy, shipping's expensive, and then it costs more, just like Kathy said. Uh -huh. But could you crush it and use it as a cover? Mm -hmm. Sure. Or shred it or whatever it is? How much volume is there? Could you, it, given the volume of the recyclable materials, is there enough stream to use it as a cover? I don't know that it would provide value from the cover standpoint. It'd just be another way of getting rid of it. You know, in uh -huh. the past we've made glass fault. We've used our roads as linear landfills for gla with glass. We've gotten rid of it that way. But in the end, you're spending more money than the commodity's worth as a value when it comes to glass. So it's just a way so of getting rid of it. Then, then it becomes just a question of who's going to pay for it, right? We've decided we don't want to pay for it. So who's going to pay for it? I mean, right? That's the question. So then the question is, goes out to the public, well, well you're paying the $500,000 now, and we could, for $500,000 or $350,000 a year, we could be doing something else for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We could, we could probably pave Bob Throm's road for, for that, right? <laughs> well, you'd yeah. have to see where that fit in the <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> the TV cameras aren't wrong. Yeah. No, <laughs> I just, I, you know, there's can, a, can we use that glass product to do that? Exactly. Yeah. Well, but, but I mean, I, I'm trying to figure out, you know, what do we do with this stuff. What, one of the ideas that you know has been floated, and and I know um, Steve Barwick's been interested in, is can you crush this and use it as pipe bedding and that sort of thing? And the issue we keep running into um, is again that volume question about making it. Yeah, because one of staff's goals, rightly or wrongly, maybe we're on the wrong track, but is to reduce that subsidy um, so that we have a more sustainable program going forward. And so we're looking for that combination of, you know, items where you can have a, a, a useful purpose for the recycled goods at a lower cost than we're, we're subsidizing it now. 
and we keep running into volume. The discussion we haven't had, I guess, that you know we could follow up on is, you know, what if we talk to Eagle about how they're dispensing of it, and if we were to create some markets for, you know, some of our public works or pipe bedding or that sort of thing, whether they could produce enough volume and do it economically, and um, maybe then they pay for the shipping on our set. I don't know, but we can look into some of those options. It's volume that's the problem, I think. Mm -hmm. Is that a, a fair? That's a fair. And for, for the reuse volume. volume the volume. lack of volume is the problem? Is that what you're saying? The lack of volume, in other words, we have $500,000. Lack of volume and lack of market, um, yeah, marketability. Yeah, because I, I don't know that we could consume that much uh, bedding material and right. such. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, if we could separate the commingled stuff, would it be worthwhile if we had a bales of aluminum for us to take that to market and make money from that, for instance? And I could see to reduce the volume, if we could have the little machine with the puffer on it that blows <laughs> the aluminum off and picks Magnus, up the yeah. iron stuff and we could crush all the glass and just use it for cover material. We could burn all the plastic stuff in a in a incinerator and generate, you know, make it a steam turbine kind of a thing. That would reduce our volume tremendously and produce some some benefit. And then the aluminum is probably the one most non-renewable resource of, of the lot of them. Mm -hmm just keep that in bundles until we had a semi-load and then take it to, to the market in Denver or something. That, I mean, that would be one option if we had a way, an easy way that we could separate the co-mingled stuff. And you have to build sorting lines and you know, we essentially be creating our own MRF yeah. at the landfill. Rob? And I, I just still agree with Rachel that what we really need is a matrix that says if we make this decision, this is how our five factors of goal success will change. Because those sound like great ideas, but you know, are they the right environmentally? Are they the right for the bottom line? Are they the right for the longevity of the landfill? Are they the right ones for this? And which ones from a policy decision do we weigh heavier than others in terms of the measures of success? And it's great to kind of think of solutions and then another one is how it how it changes public um, um, usage, you know, behaviors. behaviors. Um, because you know, you make a change on telling the public that they have to do this or spend this or do that, behaviors are going to change, and that's that's a big aspect to it too as a measure of success. Until we see at least an idea of these things. Mm -hmm. um, it's really hard to kind of come up with ideas. They're great ideas, but we have to measure what we think is successful and then how different things change those measures of success. I was in those meetings a lot. I don't know if you remember when the city spoke a lot from the restaurant standpoint. Because, and one of the big things I spoke about, which I don't think ever happened, was to have a, an analysis several years later of whether or not our cost went up. I had been recycling for years at that point, but a lot of other restaurants weren't. Yeah. And the way the other restaurants were going to make money was to lower the amount of pickups in their dumpster because they were going to be pulling that out. I didn't. I already was already recycling, so I think my cost went up. <laughs> but, <laughs> did, so. did we get a clear um, statement of the five goals that we keep talking well, about? I just want to see if everyone's no. <laughs> on the same page. I, I picked four out. If I could, George, is just see if I've hit them because a couple of people said different ones. One was uh, define financial success, and, and we haven't really defined that, but that would be one of the matrix, matrices lines. Uh, one would be diversion rate, and that was brought up as well. Another define, would define diversion rate. The amount that you can divert based on the extend program the that you have. Of, extend the light of life of the landfill. Is that how you're calling that? Well, I, I think that's. I think it's different. I think one is. I think that I think they're part and parcel of the same. So, either way, I, I guess I was thinking when I talked about diversion is actually the recycling of the product itself. 
So yeah. a, re a recycling rate could be different from a diversion <coughs> rate. Because you could divert things and throw it, get rid of it some other way. And I would say that has to do with some environmental aspect long term. Yes. But there are a lot of debates as to what that is. Like you said, you know, you, you truck something and spend a, you know, a, a gallon of gas to get it somewhere to save a minuscule amount of carbon. It's a bigger issue, but it's environment is, is part of that. Yes. Or the other part of that is you, you end up uh, recycling, transporting to another facility. That facility actually can't utilize all that to market, so it ends up in yet another landfill. Right. So we're not really recycling, we're just moving from one landfill to another landfill with a, a tremendous cost in transport. Mm -hmm. So financial uh, diversion from our landfill, total recycled material, and then, um, and then impact on the environment is that that's another line, including fossil fuel consumption that you brought up. So those are four that come up. I, I, I was working on some as well, and they may already be within yours. I'll just read them off. And I know Steve had some very nice ones to begin with. But, and, and so these may be subtitles under what you also said, but I think reasonable cost to the consumer should mm. be uh, a goal of our program. Um, the lowest subsidy possible. I'm not going to say zero and not going to tag a number in there. Um, useful purpose for recycled goods in either the marketplace or local use. Um, I think that for me and probably the board, a con continued community engagement in recycling is, is a very important outcome. And potentially increasing that uh, reduce and reuse aspects. Um, I did have extend the life of the landfill and then I still have a question mark about bottle can deposit program because I just think that potentially could reduce by another small percent the magnitude of the problem. Steve? Um, I lived in Maine for a few months and I got to see firsthand the whole system they have in New England. I think and you probably are familiar with this where they closed a whole bunch of landfills and the sites that were landfills became recycling centers, but all the trash was hauled to a, a big incinerator. It was a power plant. They were burning all the, all the trash in this power plant, producing a huge amount of electricity. And then they had the ash that was left from the power plant was a major toxic problem to deal with how, how to dispose of that. But um, it was like... A, it was a different way to approach what to do with the problems of lots of small landfills. They just consolidated it all into one big power plant, and, and that was their way of dealing with the problem. And maybe some big regional thing like that might be our ultimate solution. Yeah, I'd like to uh, explore the, the idea of regionalism and see if there's any interest out there to try to um, consolidate and get some economies of scale. Mm -hmm. Anything else? That gives you enough to work with? So we'll develop some scenarios, matrix scenarios, and come back to you in a month or two. And a little more definitive on the market trends, mm -hmm. what we're saying. Yeah. I mean, the last time we discussed this, um, the Carbondale transfer facility had not been approved yet, and we're still not sure we've accommodated that um, or understand that's longer-term impact. Mm -hmm. Okay, with that, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, <coughs> do we need time to set up for the next agenda item? Need some time? Yeah. Need some time? Let's yeah, take a, five or ten. Let's take a ten-minute break, grassroots, and we'll come back.
Okay, next on the agenda is an update on the Grand Avenue Bridge Project. And again, we have Brian Pettit here and Tom Newland and Joe Elson from CDOT. That's right. Yeah, Welcome. I'll just make a quick introduction. I've been part of a leadership team for the Grand Avenue Bridge Replacement Project for about the last year and a half. And it's gotten to a critical point where it was important to update the Board of County Commissioners on where it is, uh, some of the design decisions that have been made, and uh, the next steps on where that project's going. A lot of residents in Glenwood have been waiting for this bridge to be replaced for a lifetime. So this is an important project not only for them, but also for the Roaring Fork Valley as it is the primary conduit for commuters and commercial traffic tourists to come to Aspen. So that's why we're here today. Again, I'm here with Joe Elson from CDOT and Tom Newland, who's uh, with the, the team running the, the project. Mm -hmm. so Thanks, Brian. Did you want to kick things off, Joe? Yeah, I'll kick it off. And we've got, a, I don't know, about two dozen slides. We'll roll through and be able to take questions and answers. And so if we can go to the first one. So uh, today what we're going to cover is a little bit of the history. You know, it's part of the uh, faster legislation and our Colorado Bridge Enterprise. Uh, we'll talk about the purpose and need for it, some of the alternatives that we've been through, the public involvement, um, different areas of the project, current work on the project, schedule and milestones. Mm -hmm. So it's going to have a birthday. It's going to be 60 years old this year. It was built in 53 as a two-lane bridge, and it had shoulders and uh, sidewalks on each side. Um, it, back in the late 60s, it was converted over to a four-lane, and they took those sidewalks off, and they cantilevered the uh, pedestrian movement onto the uh, east side or upstream side of it. And uh, it's rated as a functionally obsolete uh, bridge, uh, which makes it a poor rating, and there's about 150 like bridges out there. Some of the issues with it, uh, those lanes are about nine foot, four and a half inches wide. Uh, I followed a semi over and it just basically from, it had just been recently restriped and it just took up all of the pavement right between the stripes. It, anyone who's driven over it's so quite familiar with that. There's also some vertical clearance issues over the UP Railroad um, and also over 7th Street, it's substandard. Um, the horizontal placement of the piers of the bridge right there at I-70 really constrict the amount of space that we have for the uh, eastbound on-ramp. Um, again, I think everyone's familiar with that. Everyone's got their own special story. It's not quite to Ashto code, and it's, it's very short. Um, so this project will be able to, to uh, fix that too. Mm -hmm. um, there's a pier right out in the middle of the Colorado River. It doesn't it's a spread footing. Uh, the bottom of that footing is about seven feet underneath the riverbed. In uh, 1992, there was a, a scour hole that developed that went about nine feet deep, so two feet lower than the bottom. I think uh, we lucked out and uh, didn't have something more serious happen with that. So it is a scour critical situation. Uh, the load capacity, you know, it, it, it's not posted. It, it still can handle the, the current loads. It's just that we've only got about half of the, the strength um, of what a new bridge would have. So it's, it's got some issues there. And also being 60 years old, there's some, some fatigue issues. Um, some of the, uh, the riveted connections are, are not what uh, we'd want them to be. If we went in and tried to do any kind of a rehab, we'd have to, to use the, the higher code levels. and. Uh, it really would, would mean that we'd be in a, a depletion of the fatigue life in a very short order. So. Uh, FASTER program, probably familiar with this. Uh, it's an acronym for Funding Advancements for Surface Transportation and Economic Recovery. Short version is you're uh, registering your vehicle got a little bit more expensive, probably about $13, $15 per year type thing. Um, it's a much needed source of revenue for the CDOT. Um, it's split into three general pools, this faster bridge uh, pool, the faster safety, you know, if you see the uh, wildlife fencing going on on 82 and on I-70, a lot of those projects are, 
faster safety, and then of course there's the the faster statewide transit that's part of that. So. And the shale bluffs rock fall. That was part of that too. Very good. So next. So we've been going at this for quite a while. Um, we've had the project team underway since. Uh, uh, summer of 2011 we're working on what's called an environmental assessment uh, category of NEPA which is not quite as intensive as a, an EIS and uh, more complicated than a categorical exclusion we kicked off the public scoping on uh, November 11th 2011 and we've had a very comprehensive public involvement process and Tom yeah let me talk a little bit about that intensive public involvement process, which it really has been. You know, we've been going at this for about a year and a half now. We uh, established three groups to work um, to kind of head off this project. And the first one is the project leadership team, which Brian is a part of. And this team primarily makes sure that the study team, which is part of the project working group down there, all of us working on the project, are following what's known as a context sensitive solution process to come up with uh, the right bridge for the for the community and it really is context sensitive solution really means the bridge needs to fit in with the community not just physically but economically and, and socially as well you know it really has to work well for the community or um, it, it's not going to work properly uh, we also developed a stakeholders working group which really helped us uh, through the process these are interested and very engaged citizens who are willing to come to afternoon meetings for three or four hours and roll up their sleeves and tackle the hard issues with us and give us their input. Yeah. And then the project working group is essentially uh, all of the representatives from CDOT departments, uh, Joe of course and his, his uh, engineers and the uh, project working, I'm sorry, the project consultant group uh, of which I'm a part of. Um, we, had a, we used a lot of tools in this process from public meetings, to small group and individual meetings. Um, we have event participation going on. I'm actually going to the first farmer's market uh, after this meeting to uh, have a little uh, tent out there to show people where we're at in the process. It's a very good way to get interaction to people who wouldn't normally come to meetings. Uh, we're also going to the Strawberry Days events. We're going out to chambers and, and local uh, <coughs> civic groups as well. Um, we have email updates, surveys, news releases. We even are doing uh, public advertisements on a pretty regular basis down in the post uh, with uh, you know frequently asked questions and stuff. So really a lot of work. Uh, we've contacted over 1,500 stakeholders through these processes. We've had five, we're gonna have five public open houses. Uh, we've had four so far. Um, there's been 50 plus meetings with businesses and stakeholders. Uh, 15 minutes with public or 15 meetings with uh, public officials. I mentioned the strawberry days and farmer markets and the uh, civics group. So we've also got a website uh, and it's really been a, I think a really good process as far as public involvement goes. Did you want me to keep going or? Yeah, you keep going. So the first thing we do in an environmental assessment process is to develop a purpose and need for the project. And I've underlined purpose on this slide because this is the purpose of the project, to provide a safe, secure, and effective connection between downtown Glenwood Springs and across the Colorado, Colorado River and I-70 to the historic Glenwood Hot Springs area. So the purpose is real specific to going from downtown over to the Hot Springs area. Now the need as several different bullets as you can see there, but really to improve connectivity between downtown Glenwood Springs and the Roaring Fork Valley with the historic Hot Springs pool. So that's really kind of the need, but there's other kind of sub needs, if you will, about uh, the condition of the bridge, the future traffic increases, um, and try to address the functionality and structural deficiencies. It's, a, it's an aging bridge in court condition, and the piers are adjacent to I-70. So those are kind of the, some of the needs that we did. And then we embarked on an alternative selection process. So the, this kind of gives you a summary of how that works. First of all, you develop all the alternatives you can think of, um, and then you put them through this basic screening process, a three-level screening process from a fatal flaw analysis, which weeds out a lot of them, down to what we call a qualitative screening, where we kind of uh, rate them based on measures of effectiveness. How well does it handle traffic? How less of an impact does it have on an environment? Several of these qualitative factors. And then finally, we go into a quantitative screening where we look to see 
um, which alternatives do not meet the project needs as well as others and of course the ones that are more better fitted to the project needs continue uh, through the uh, screening. It's like one of those Japanese pinball machines. Yeah. <laughs> the jingo. And it was kind of like that. We, uh, <laughs> we came up with 11 different alternatives with the uh, SWG and the study team. And then through the public meeting process, there were four other alternatives brought forward by citizens outside of the s stakeholders working group. It was about a six month process to go through that, uh, that screening that I showed you on the last slide. But um, this kind of gives it to you in a summary off on the left hand side here. This is how I do it? Yeah. We had kind of three different landing areas on the north side where we could put the bridge. Uh, and then we had three on the south side as well. Grand Avenue, Cooper, and uh, did I do that right? Cooper? Uh, Colorado. In Colorado. Uh, and then we also looked at a lot of different one-way couplet ideas as well too where you could have one come in on one street and go out on the other. Uh, so there were 11, about 11 that way. And uh, after going through that screening process, we came up with what's known as alternative 3E as the preferred, recommended preferred alternative. And that leaves downtown Glenwood Springs on Grand Avenue, curves over the highway of the river and the Glenwood Hot Springs pool and makes more or less a direct connection to I-70 uh, as opposed to what you do now coming down to the Colorado or to the Hot Springs and then taking a left over to Laurel and 6th. Um, this was selected for a variety of reasons. It uh, helped with traffic congestion. Um, it also had the ability to kind of free up this area of Glenwood Springs for possible redevelopment as a more pedestrian friendly uh, area. And uh, that direct connection to uh, I-70 also got rid of what, what do we call that? Conf con confusion Junction? Oh, malfunction Junction. Malfunction <laughs> Junction there at uh, the Village Inn. So. There is a lot of good uh, uh, reasons why we selected this alternative as the build alternative to move forward into the environmental assessment. Yes, Rachel. Uh, thank, thank you. I'm a little confused because when I think of going over the current bridge, I look to the right and I see the hot springs pool. Yep. And so that's right over here. Right. So it's not really going over the hot springs pool. No, I'm sorry. Hot springs parking lot. Excuse me. I'm sorry. It's over the parking lot now. And then it lands right where the cell shell station is. So there will be a taking of that shell station as part of this project. We'll have to go. And is that green spot in the middle just kind of open space land? Well, yeah, we just kind of painted it green to illustrate that it's an area for possibly an entrance opportunity for Glenwood Springs. Um, but yeah, it's a rather open area. And things are changing a little bit on this alternative, particularly with that intersection, which I'll, we'll show you in a minute. In fact, I'll show it to you right now. <laughs> so um, we looked at that intersection. Let me go back. The, the intersection with a light right here at the corner um, of Village Inn. And we selected that one for a couple of reasons. Uh, but um, we took it out to the public and showed it to them. And they were real concerned about the, uh, they thought it was going to be a confusing intersection, especially for visitors to, get to Glenwood Springs. And they asked us to go take a look at it again and see if we can come up with something that would be more functional and easier for the user. And we came up with one with a, uh, roundabout here at this intersection as opposed to the light, um, which makes it easier not only uh, to navigate, but also for pedestrians as well who can get around and up to the north side here. There's a lot of pedestrian use in the Sixth Avenue corridor, uh, so we really need to pay attention to that. And you'll also notice too that we have an under uh, underpass for pedestrians as well um, to get around that intersection and get over to the Sixth Street area. So that's kind of what we're doing here on the current work. And Joe can kind of continue here. Yeah. Um, next slide, please. Mm -hmm. So some of the things we're really starting to focus on now is, uh, you know, what should these bridges look like? Um, the vehicular bridge, you know, we've got about eight or nine um, types of bridges right now. They're all uh, following our uh, CSS, Contact Sensitive Solution process for the I-70 Mountain Corridor, which puts us into a, having a box structure, you know, kind of like on the Maroon Creek Bridge and not having like plate structures. Um, we've got a, uh, a contractor on board, a uh, Construction Manager General Contractor, or CMGC. It's a best value procurement. 
Um, it's kind of a two-phase thing where we get them on our design team to talk about constructability and risk and, and pricing and uh, they start giving us pricing and if we uh, can reach agreement we'll have them build the project. Uh, but it's, it's been just great for you know getting input. We've had one session with them about the different types and you know we've got different span configurations right now um, and just getting input back from them on what's the riskier one, what looks like it's going to be potentially more cost uh, just to help us with a, 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 you know, a structure selection process. We've also got a, uh, a ped bridge. When we started on this project, we really didn't know that uh, we were going to be looking at a new pedestrian bridge down there that um, the city built the one that's there back in 1985. Um, and it's a great bridge. There's a lot of uh, really positive things about it. It is a bit narrow. And it also, um, it, you know, there are level of service uh, indicators that you can, you can put those ped bridges through to just see, you know, how it is for, for handling traffic. We've done counts out there. Probably one of the biggest things about it was the utilities. There's a lot of utilities on the existing bridge. We need to be able to, uh, when it's time to, to switch traffic over, we're going to do it in a uh, accelerated bridge construction uh, type of a process. So we need to have those utilities moved. They, w they weren't able to go on the existing bridge for a variety of reasons. Also, um, you see like this truss element that's shown, there, there's a truss element like that on the existing bridge over by I-70, and I talked earlier about that, that on-ramp and the need to make those improvements. That, that truss element would be in that envelope, so that's kind of a non-starter there. So um, we're getting a lot of uh, great interest on, on what type of a, a nice ped bridge to put in. So um, the, the things we're looking at now is to try to, and I'll, I'll have some slides on, on different ideas that we have, also, what, how to get the um, American with Disabilities Act, or ADA, uh, part down. Like right now, from the existing bridge, it comes down along Grand. Since we're making the vehicular bridge about 16 feet wider, uh, we did some story polling where we came out, and uh, that was a fun day, uh, <laughs> put polls with, you know, here's different uh, places where the bridge could be, you know, both horizontally and vertically. And we definitely got some feedback that we don't need to, you know, make it as, as narrow as you can and as low as you can. So uh, we've moved towards there's going to have to be um, some other way, either an elevator. We're still talking to the city about that. And or there could be some kind of a ramp that comes here and, you know, maybe zigzags back and forth like a scissors uh, type uh, movement there. So next. Mm -hmm. Um, here's some, it's hard to get a vantage point of, of where to, to look, you know, just with all the, the trees. This is the, uh, the train depot. You're on the south side of the river looking west. And, uh, you know, you probably recognize, here's the photo that this was taken from. But here's like an, a through arch type configuration. We had about 14 different types. Next one, please. Um, here's a couple more. Here's what we call the asymmetrical cable stay. Uh, here's one with a, like a vertically cable stayed bridge. We're also looking, uh, we, you know, I think as Tom stated, we're a little bit, we're quite flexible. We really want this to be the right CSS um, solution. So, you know, we're, we're looking pretty hard. We're going to have a really good meeting with uh, the Glenwood City Council on June 20th to, to really talk through some of these and maybe even open it up a little bit. Uh, these are some images that, that were done by a by a consultant uh, for the Glenwood Springs DDA, the Downtown Development Authority. Uh, Jim Leggett of Studio Insight uh, is the artist here. So, uh, um, actually, that's not right. This one's by our study team. The the last one that we had uh, was by Jim Leggett. But we're gonna, just going to be able to to really apply some of the nice finishes, you know, artistically. To help kind of move that process and try to converge on uh, on the right solution. Next. Um, so again, we're looking at uh, some of the aesthetics. Um, you know, what kind of span lengths? These are plate girders. Uh, we won't have that. Are there, you know what kind of lighting treatments? Are they constant depth or are they haunched like the Maroon Creek Bridge? 
Um, you know, what kind of substructure elements do we have? Um, you know, do we use weathering steel? This is the bridge uh, just downstream from the, uh, the surf wave, which is happening right now, if you didn't know. <laughs> yeah. Just on a side note. Uh, next. Um, this is the uh, view of the, the current bridge. Um, you know, it's kind of dark under there. Pigeons really seem to enjoy it. Um, this is the back wall or abutment face of this bridge. With our new design, um, we're glomming onto things that we heard from, from way back at the initial scoping meeting was to try to open up that area. And we're going to move that, uh, that back wall about 70 feet to the south. And it's, it's going to raise up. As you can see, you know, this isn't quite standard. We're going to have to come up to get over the railroad and 7th Street. We're going to go with a little bit thinner um, structure through here and, and be able to uh, the bridge will end up being about three feet higher, but we'll be able to, you know, make that area a little bit bigger. That alleyway that's kind of mid-block, you'll be able to kind of sight through that and walk through that if that kind of helps you with that. So uh, should be a big, uh, a big improvement for the city. Uh, here's some artist r renderings of, you know, what that could look like. Uh, you know, art festivals, maybe the farmer's market goes down there. I've heard people talk about maybe a, a skating rink under there. Mm -hmm. uh, that could be interesting. Um, again, while we're still on this one, um, you know, we're adding about 11 feet of width to the overall bridge width that's out there right now in the downtown area. It's a 40-foot wide vehicular bridge, and there's a, about a 6-foot the ped piece, the ADA piece for the ped, and our new vehic vehicular bridge is going to be like 56 feet. So, is it going to still be four lanes, and just wider lanes? That's correct. It'll be four lanes. Um, there'll be 12 foot lanes when you're out over the river, and then we start um, transitioning down to 11 foot lanes. That's what most of Grand Avenue is through town is 11 foot lanes until you get out to. Kind of where it does that jog out there. South Glen Avenue starts. So, on yeah. next one. Yeah. So the next slide is kind of a similar one to this, except a kind of a different look. And these are the kind of things we're going to the public with right now to see which one's better from an aesthetic point of view. Would you see this one has the uh, piers underneath? They're a little bit slimmer. They're not sticking like on the outside of this one. Mm -hmm. um, but also. Uh, I, I don't know, you know, it's just those kinds of aesthetic calls that we really need to to question the community about to make sure we do it right. You know, and back up one, uh, sure. you know, another thing that's probably of the most concern to, to people up in this end of the valley is uh, a, a lot of this is going to be done, you know, with maybe a simple lane closure or, or not much interference, but then we're going to get to a point where, you know, this bridge is right where the old one is. So. Um, again, back to the stakeholder working group. Um, that group originally started as a visioning session with, with key um, downtown stakeholders and others uh, that didn't want to, you know, just be disbanded. They're like, hey, how can we stay involved? So we started the stakeholder working group, but we asked them, would you rather have, a, you know, stage the demo over a long period of time where you're, you know, we'll take half the lanes away and and do it that way, or would you rather we just uh, really plan it and have like a short, you know, say under two month closure and they're like, let's just plan that, the, the shorter full closure, plan it for a, a shoulder season, you know, spring or fall. And again, we still don't know which one of those it's going to be because there's constraints at every turn on this project. You know, you've got the Colorado River, you've got the Hot Springs Pool, you've got the Leadville Limestone Aquifer that feeds the Hot Springs Pool. Um, uh, we've got trout restrictions, spring and fall, you know, there's just everywhere you look. Um, but again, that's, that's why we really want to have the right contractor and, uh, you know, we had a lot of interest. It was very hard to get down to the one that we picked. Their name is uh, Granite in joint venture with R.L. Wadsworth. And uh, they're kind of stationed out of Salt Lake City. They're, they're very adept at these accelerated bridge construction. You know, they'll replace an entire interchange. And, you know, first it was, you know, 36 hours, then 24, then 18. And, you know, it's like the president of one of their companies says, you know, we're 
product of our own success. They just keep screwing them down harder on the, uh, mm. you know, less time. But these are things, you know, like just these columns, you know, they're already looking at how can they do this, you know, what, what's that right balance of accelerated bridge construction? Because, you know, right now the existing bridge is here. You know, could they be building this while traffic's still running here so that it's just that one less thing to do, so. Joe, what's the difference between an accelerated process two months versus a longer process that would not have as much traffic impacts? Um, in, it's probably, uh, it would probably be about, a, from a time standpoint, probably a, um, at least several months, probably six to eight months. It's, uh, it depends. There's, there's different ways of doing it. You know, right now we're, we're planning on doing some improvements to the Midland, um, Midland Avenue at the, just to the west, the city street. It gets a lot of commuter traffic as it is. Uh, just doing some improvements over there to be able to, to take the traffic. It's going to be 82 traffic for, you know, we're, we're pretty set on it being no more than two months. You know, we're, we like to under promise and over deliver and uh, we need to find out more before we can get too uh, too wild with our estimates so so during that one total closure period everyone will be shunted to the target bridge i mean the bridge down by yeah the, that bridge at west glenwood you know we're already talking with with rafta quite a bit to, to try to figure out we have to take probably about 20 to 25 percent of the traffic off so uh, through a variety of methods, you know, get them on transit, which, you know, Rafta would be thrilled to get some new customers that really see how nice those uh, vehicles are and, and uh, maybe they stay. Uh, you know, again, it, it'll be during a shoulder period. Uh, maybe there's more biking. The new pedestrian bridge, we've committed that we will have that ped bridge in and, and yeah. that will be a way for people to get across, you know, maybe some creative parking where people can come in and maybe they have a vehicle or a or a bike on the other side, things like that. So, or a raft of bus, or a raft of bus on the other side. Yeah, we're already talking to them. We cycle maybe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, here's our schedule. So, you know, here we are. What halfway through 2013? Um, we're going through NEPA. We've got that CMGC that we talked about. Uh, you know, we'll be working with them for, you know, probably a good uh, year and a half. Uh, later this year, we'll be going through the agency review of the, the EA document. Then it'll go out probably, uh, probably in January, there'll be like the, the formal public hearing process um, related to that EA. Uh, then we'll be working towards the decision document, hopefully, you know, May or June of 2014. We'll launch into final design. Um, and then construction, we're showing it here starting like in early 2015. One of the advantages also of the CMGC process is you can, uh, you can target these individual uh, packages. You know, they, they need to be severable, but you can say, hey, let's, let's get you going. Let's get a price on uh, the Pedbridge package, and, you know, maybe it can come out sooner. Uh, there might be a utility move package, things like that. So it, it's pretty convenient to be able to give some flexibility uh, to the owner. One, one other uh, pitch, uh, this is my third CMGC project, uh, and I just think it's, it's a fabulous, uh, it's part of the Federal Highways Administration Everyday Counts. Um, you know, they've done some research. It's like an average of 16 years from the, the start of, hey, here's an idea for a project to the ribbon cutting, um, and, and just looking at different ways, and it's, it's I think, takes on the advantages of design build um, and really keeps a lot of the uh, control with the owner, which we like. We have the, both the designer and the contractor at the same table and not just putting together some kind of a, a book that we give to a consultant led by a contractor team that has to, you know, read everything and, and make sure that they understand everything and hopefully we didn't miss something. Um, and uh, and have them uh, go out and, and build the project. This way we're able to be at the table and, and identify risk and, and really make sure that the right entity has the risk. So, um, 
and there's a nice picture from back in the old days. Of yep, that's the 1893 Grand Avenue Bridge that was first constructed and replaced by the one that we're replacing now. So, any other questions? So, Joe, um, what's, what sort of budget are you working with, and does that budget include the bridge, the pedestrian overpass, the roundabout? Um, Right now, we think it's in the like fifty-five million dollar range for, the, for all those components. Yeah. Again, as we you know, we're, we've still got several bridge types, so some are more expensive than others. So, but we feel like that's generally in the ballpark for right for what we know right now. So. And that's all comes out faster funds, the entire mm -hmm. amount. Right. No, no federal funds. Um, that's a good question. Some of the. Uh, the money that we're using on the environmental assessment and the design is bond backed. So they went out with, uh, they put some faster money up and uh, they're, they're paying it back with, it's federalized. So federal bridge replacement or BR funds uh, are coming in. There's also every time, you know, you write your check for your vehicle registration that goes into a, a state funded kitty too. So uh, it shows the importance of maintaining that that vehicle registration fee which where there's a certain group of people who would like to see that go away and of course you wouldn't be able to do projects like this without those dollars it'd be inconceivable yeah it's a little crazy you know i think uh <laughs> this is reminding me of coming up to the pickin county board uh, back in what 2003 uh, talking about the maroon creek bridge when that sufficiency rating went down to a nine from a 41 and and uh you know, we didn't even have the money. Thank you for you know stepping up and saying here, why don't you design it? And and we were able to. There was we were just really very lucky. You know, there was that uh, uh, other funding source that came available, the House Bill 1310 money. But we get about three million dollars a year f uh, to Region Three, which is right now 14 counties on the Western Slope. We're picking up Summit County in a couple of weeks. Um, and you know that's just really not enough money. I mean, you can't do much at three million dollars. So. Yeah. Well, as a side note to that, I've been involved in some of the future transportation funding discussions, and the point I've made, and I think others should make when they have the chance, is that we need to see more money flowing to the TPRs if there is such a statewide solution coming forward for statewide gas tax or sales tax or something. But it shouldn't just be the project list that's presented, that the many board members and staff who put all their time into these regional prioritizations at TPR meetings, they need to have some pot of money to work with. There used to be a time when there was nine or 12 million a year, you know, depending on the size of your TPR, it right. fluctuated. But I think that's an important element to keep moving forward. And you know, I think Steve knows and others that we've always been at the CCI table to say, no, do not repeal faster, <laughs> or don't eliminate the late fees, or whatever you know is being proposed, because uh, we need the right. money. We need the safe bridges. That's a good point, especially as we kick off the you know 2040 planning year. Uh, starts tomorrow, right? <laughs> <laughs> the Intermountain TPR. So. Yeah. Other questions, Steve? Um, just a thought. Um, if you could make sure that the Grand Avenue closure happens when Independence Pass is open. Hmm. That's um, a good point. Because that would be, for, for people up at this end of the valley, that's going to be their way to get to I-70 is through Leadville, probably. Relief valve. Except for the big trucks, of course, or delivery trucks. Won't be able to They'll still try it. <laughs> Possibly uh, Cottonwood Our Pass. Google. Some people probably would be wanting to use Cottonwood Pass, so you might look at that. and. Not, I don't. I know you don't want to put a lot of money into improving something like that when you have to do stuff on Midland Avenue, but it would yeah. be uh, something to consider, anyhow. You know? no, that's a good point. In fact, Brian called me when we had the, uh, you know, the the fire out in Glenwood Canyon a couple of weeks ago, and you know, it was like I think it was a day before we were planning on opening the pass, and can you do it one day earlier? And they, we tried. We, we they just couldn't pull it off. Uh, but no, that's a good point. That really would point more towards that fall season. Mm -hmm. So that's one we'll make sure we get into the list. Thanks. Mm -hmm. 
Any other questions? Looks like good work. Yeah. Great, yeah. thanks. I'm sure the public outreach for the delivery trucks during that two month closure period and, and the other pedestrians, that's gonna be key, you know, to people knowing yeah, pu public information during the project is going to be critical because that's what most people most people if they know what's going on it answers a lot of their questions and they don't they're not left with well what's going on you know what what do i do so yeah that's a key part okay. have you guys done any traffic modeling at this point to know what the choke down is going to be um, when you have reduced lanes because we've got a lot of traffic moving that direction i assume you're going to have some diverted down off of the other, the uh, West Glenwood exit. Right. And then you'll have some limited, more limited capacity. Has there been any modeling done at this point? Yeah, and yes, and that's what uh, that drove that need to, to knock about 20 to 25 percent off. Or if we don't, then we get some excessive queuing. But that should allow, you know, we'll flag a lot of things. We'll, there'll be some changes uh, to access, you know, maybe some right in, right out only along Midland, those types of things. We haven't fully developed that, but if we can get, if we can knock that, you know, 20, 25 percent off, it should, should get through there in about, you know, 20 minutes, say, from one end to the other. So. Some sort of priority queuing for the buses? You know, we've used that successfully on other Highway 82 projects, so uh, we're looking at that. Um, Again, you've got to have a free lane to give them, so, so great. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you very much for right. the update. Thank you, Thanks. Appreciate it very much. Uh -huh. right. We're a little ahead of schedule. We could take a break or move forward, and that's what we'd like to do. Okay, so then we'll move on to the memos of interest. Yeah, let me catch up with you, George. Okay. We just have one memo, memo of interest. I'm pulling up right now. It's a thank you letter. A series of thank you letters. A series of thank you letters for grants received from the uh, Healthy Community Fund. Um, so you, um, the Andy Zanka Youth Empowerment Program, um, Youth Zone, ACES, the Colorado 14ers Initiative, Aspen Valley Foundation, Roaring Fork Family Resource Centers. Uh, all of these organizations have sent in thank you letters for uh, grants that were received through the Healthy Community Fund. Okay. And that is it for memos of interest. Okay, so let's move on to future agendas. Yeah, so a few items for future agendas. Um, first, uh, we, we have been trying to set up uh, meetings with our neighboring counties. And Steve, for your, for your benefit, we once a year try and meet with uh, um, most of our, our neighboring counties. We have not been meeting uh, with, with Mesa County historically, but all our other bordering counties uh, uh, that we share a more substantial border with, uh, we try and get together with once a year. Um, Lake County uh, has gotten back to us and they would like to meet uh, in Twin Lakes on September 3rd at 1 p.m. So we'll um, put that on the future agendas. Obviously, we're not that far, far out at this point. Um, Gunnison County hasn't uh, committed to any dates, um, but they have indicated that they would like to meet on a Tuesday this year. Historically, we've met on a, on a Monday. Right now, there are three Tuesdays that um, would work in, well, two Tuesdays that work in the summer, one in the fall. Um, one is uh, July 2nd, the other is August 20th, and then we have September 24th that we currently don't have anything on your Tuesday agendas. And we wanted to see if there's a preference on the board's part that we could get back to Gunnison County with. Are we going over there? Are they coming over here? We and we're, uh, well, we're still going to work that out. We're thinking about uh, trying to meet in Redstone again, I think. So, but we haven't finalized those details yet. We want to get a date nailed down. Well, I would, in either case, I would shoot for the fall. It'd be a nice time to travel anywhere and 
that we end up in Redstone would be good for a little business for that community. So September 24th, which would be what uh, three weeks after our meeting with Lake County. Should we work on that? Yeah. When was the meet meeting with Gunnison last year? I I attended that one in Redstone, but I don't remember what it's around the same time. Yeah, it was around the same time. I think it might have been late August. I, I can't remember off the top of my head. Okay. Um, the other item is um, we have a request to, well, we have a proposal to do a site visit at the Lost Marbles Ranch. Um, we've got a few dates uh, that that would work. That would be posted as, as an executive session. Um, we're looking at Monday, June 17th uh, after 10 a.m. or the morning of June 19th, which is Wednesday. We're anticipating we'll need about four hours for board members that'd be on that. What was that date again? We have uh, June seventeenth uh, after ten a.m. or the morning of June nineteenth. Okay. The nineteenth, I'll be in Vail for the QQ meeting. Okay. So Does June the seventeenth? And what do you anticipate the time frame of this? It's going to be about a four-hour tour, is what they're anticipating, including travel back and forth. Yeah. Yeah. Does the 17th work for us to try and schedule in the morning uh, after 10? 17th works better for me. It works. Michael? Uh, it's sort of provisional. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. if I have to, I'll do it. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll work with Charlotte to try and uh, work with you guys um, on the 17th and see how that works. Would, would the um is the morning better than the afternoon, or does it matter? I, I'm open for either. And I'm just curious. Refresh my memory where Lost Marble is. I'm trying to blind. East Upper Creek Road. East Upper Creek. Morning or afternoon doesn't matter too much. Yeah, and the 17th it just has to be after 10. So. And then we're going to um, have staff there as well from. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. John, are you talking June next week? Yeah. 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 Next okay. week. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So just then, sometime after ten. So we'll have to know pretty soon. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we'll work on that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um. The only other item, and it's not a specific date, but you know, it kind of falls within uh, future agendas and open discussion. Um, the state has released the draft rules regarding recreational uh, marijuana. Uh, as a county, we have until October 1st um, to adopt local regulations. Um, if that is, is going to be an allowed use, um, we are starting to see a number of inquiries related to um, recreational uh, marijuana facilities. Um, so that's going to be a set of discussions now that we have the rules uh, that we'll be setting up with the board as far as establishing what our um, regulatory environment is going to be here in Pickens County, similar to what we had to do with uh, medical marijuana uh, in terms of developing an ordinance. So. Um, we're going to be working on the attorney's office is going through those draft rules right now. Uh, based on that review, we'll be putting a schedule together to, to have time for uh, policy discussions and recommendations um, so we can be in a position to have something adopted by October 1st. Rachel? Um. I was going to say the July 2nd seems pretty wide open as a work session if mm -hmm. it works for some initial conversations about that or presentations yep. or anything our attorneys need to tell us as well. So okay. See where it goes from there. Excellent. Anybody else? Are you done? I'm done. Yep. Future agendas, Rob? I just had a few questions of two things that I didn't see anywhere on Future's agenda, so I was just curious where they stood from last week and I think the week before. 
the we cycle uh, budget request? Yeah, so we're um, bringing that back. We had, a, quite frankly, we just had GR busy on the AABC project, and so we, we put the um, we cycle budget request off for, for a week or so. So we'll, we'll bring that back. We're also doing the, the research. The minutes, um, the, the materials uh, reflected that we actually had intended to use those impact grant dollars, um, but the minutes didn't reflect specific direction, so we're digging a little bit more. And the other one was the, the, uh, the housing mitigation um, calculation. That one, I'm work, I need to work more with John and Tom on scheduling to bring back. And, and, and I, we don't I have it scheduled we, right now. We talked about having another work session on that before it comes right. back to us. Right. The other thing I would suggest on July 2nd, since, since it is open, there may be an opportunity to um, see if uh, Senator Schwartz is, is in town. Okay. for a work session, see what's going on for next year's legislative agenda. Okay. Rachel. Yeah, um, that also brings up, and I'm, I'm not sure to what level there should or could be board involvement, but the school finance ballot measure, which will be on the November ballot, and how that impacts our school district. Um, you know, again, I'm very supportive of greater funding for schools statewide, but how do I get out and promote a question that may actually hurt our school districts? And, um, you know, kind of finding out what, what the final shakeout was of the final bill that's passed. And I've heard there's maybe some corrective measures they can take in the ballot mm -hmm. description, but I, I don't know anything about that. And so, again, I just think that it'd be good for us, whether it's a, a joint meeting with the school board getting it scheduled instead of in the fall or um, you know, just some dialogue with them. But I'd, I'd like to have okay. some sense of how we can uh, assist their school district. Uh, June 18th, we've got a special meeting set up for the abatement hearings, and I know it's always changes at the last minute. But yeah. It'd be good to have an idea of how many, how many to make sure we have yeah. enough time or too much time. We'll double check that. Yeah. Okay. okay, anything else on future agendas for anybody? Just a small comment that on the very last page, I will be able to attend that Wednesday, the July 24th, unless oh, there's airline okay. problems, I'll be flying back early. Okay, with that, we can move on to open discussion. Yeah, my, my only item was kind of the combined one on the... Um, you know, rules being issued on the recreational marijuana, so. Okay, anybody else have anything for open discussion? Steve? No, I have a couple of things. Um, one, for me, it was a takeaway moment at the State of the River meeting, and that has to do with the Wheeler Ditch here in Aspen, and I think they had it on their agenda at City Council last night where the city is planning on leasing some of the water rights from Wheeler Ditch to the CWCB to put in, to leave into the Roaring Fork later in the summer and it will help add some water to that hole where it's, the Roaring Fork gets so low below the Salvation and Wheeler Ditch going through Aspen before it hits Castle Creek. And so that, that seemed like a really good project and the city would compensate they have a plan for compensating for the irrigation of the trees and things, I think using well water or maybe they can use some Castle Creek water somehow to make make up for the loss of some of the Wheeler Ditch water. But I thought that was really a, a good project that can help the Roaring Fork during the, later in the summer when it gets so dry. Um, this, Second item, um, George and I attended the Frying Pan Caucus meeting last night. And as I think both of us knew going in, their, their two main concerns are the issue on Miller Creek and also their road situation there. But 
to me, I think the Miller Creek issue is a matter of, you know, it's a public safety kind of an issue that um, I think we should all at least remain aware of, if if not do something about right now. Um, the Forest Service has a plan of action for four different alternatives. Let me read them off to you just so you get it accurately. Miller Creek is up, up the frying pan and the issue is there, there's uh, one of the owners up there uh, has set up some uh, blockages uh, for two Forest Service roads, Forest Service Road 52521, uh, and, and preventing uh, ingress not only for the public, for uh, National Forest, but also for some uh, other property owners. So um, right now it's a situation where the Forest Service is, again, as we talked before, the Forest Service is trying to do some due diligence to see whether they actually, uh, who owns that road whether it's a Forest Service road, whether it's a county road, whether it's a private road. So they're working on that issue right now. And then, um, but for, for those other uh, landowners who own some property up there, it's also may end up being a, a civil case for them in terms of trying to get a judgment uh, where one of the uh, owners up there is preventing access to, uh, to those properties. So the safety issue is there's sort of a uh, one of those owners who is creating this issue has been making uh, threatening uh, remarks and menacing some people. So the sheriff's department is well aware of it. And they've been up several times and they've asked uh, the citizens up there that if there's any complaints or any issues uh, that they feel they're being threatened or menaced to call the sheriff's department immediately, then they would have a record to go up and, and deal with the, uh, the perpetrator. Uh, because there, it's a public safety issue that can't really deal with what right now be maybe some sort of a civil suit. You know, the the Forest Service has four different things they're looking at now. One would be to have the road uh, be a prescriptive right of way because of. 20 plus years of maintenance that the Forest Service has been maintaining the road. Uh, second option would be that Picking County would assert our ownership as a county road, which would be a possibility. Um, third option would be the Forest Service would get a reciprocal easement from each landowner of the, of the private land along the way. And the fourth option would be to take the road through condemnation proceedings. Um, and there has, there have actually been shots fired in this thing by the landowner in, in question up there. And, and he's also met some people with his gun in hand to block, block them from using the road. So um, that's why it, it really is a, you know, public safety concern on the, and all of the people there from the Thomasville area are, are really concerned about it and um, are hoping that we, we in the Forest Service can come up with a solution for it. I know Burke Pierce is looking in, I believe, to any county ownership or right of way issues. Now, so we and and I do know the sheriff is well aware of the, the situation up there. Yeah, and there were about what three or four of our sheriff's deputies were up there at the meeting last night too. So they're they're totally tuned in to this. Okay. Anybody else have anything for open discussion? Rachel. Yeah. Thank you. I just wanted to report back a little bit on the. Um, Interfacing Compact Committee meeting that was in Keystone last week. And uh, I would say, I think it's fair to say there was an increased emphasis on the timelines and getting a statewide water plan done uh, based on an executive order that was issued by the governor on May 14th. 
and I will put uh, extra copies in the read box, and I have uh, given a packet of this information to John Ely to look at. Um, but there's a lot of components of it that, you know, at least give you pause, um, particularly, I mean, not particularly, but the overview is the Colorado Water Conservation Board is directed to commence the work necessary to submit a draft Colorado water plan for review by the governor's office no later than December 10th, 2014. The CWCB will work with the governor's office to complete the final plan and have it adopted no later than December 10th, 2015. Sounds like a lot of time, it's not. Um, but the order also says is uh, the C Colorado Water Conservation Board is directed to align the state's role in water project permitting and review processes with the water values included in the Colorado Water Plan and to streamline the state's role in the approval and regulatory processes regarding water projects. And there's always been uh, concern about this consolidation of power and the state starting to be the sponsor of these projects as opposed to individual water providers and things like that. What, what does that mean to uh, the affected basins? Uh, an emphasis on expediating permitting processes. Um, there also is um, a lot of talk of what was being called a, a referendum A version 2 and that was a statewide water funding question that failed about 10, 12 years ago. Um, so they're starting to look at, could there be a statewide mill levy for funding water projects? Should there be increased statewide sales tax for water funding projects, things like that. Um, but you know, that's the governor's order. People are now working under, uh, and there are shakeups. Uh, Jennifer Gimbel has not been given her contract again to head up the CWCB. Um, additionally, there's three little white papers that are all titled something along the No Regrets, Low Regrets Action Plan, um, but uh, they are very specific in this, in, in saying um, meet environmental and recreational <coughs> needs while preserving new supply options. Consider utilizing existing tools that have successfully addressed environmental protection, allowing for additional water development to occur in the future. And all they list is all the voluntary programs that can be ripped out as soon as there's a water shortage. Uh, they don't uh, consider recreational channel diversions such as the town of Gunnison has, or the town of Golden has, or these things that really protect their water resources. So they're just talking about uh, very minimal flows uh, going forward. Um, and I think we just need to do what we can. They would like to see alternate processes to wild and scenic river designations not any wild and scenic river designations actually occurring in the state. Um, the example is actually the endangered fish program where we've kept the endangered fish off of the federal list by having all this voluntary compliance uh, in the state of Colorado. And so um, they'd like to do voluntary things to make sure maybe your goals with wild and scenic are satisfied, but we don't want it to be permanent, lasting, or enforceable. Uh, and so those are, are real challenges, and that also is the same with uh, which one of this. Um, go. So a lot of documents to look over. Um, that recreational in channel diversions, comma, wild and scenic river designations, and other non consumptive flow projects in areas where a new supply project may be built need to have an allowance for the projects to proceed. So they would like to kind of carve out from any of those types of programs the ability to take um, significant amounts of new water um, in, in developing the statewide plan. So the meeting uh, on the 24th of the Colorado River Basin 1177 in Glenwood Springs, um, this is really going to be brought very strongly to that group. It's time for that group to make more definitive statements. It's, very awkward because that group doesn't really have staffing, say the way that Denver Metro has staffing from Denver Water or Colorado Basin has all the staffing from Colorado Springs Utility or you know, South Platte has Northern. They have brain power, they have lawyers, they have staff time. And so we, we have been outnumbered, we continue to be outnumbered in terms of protecting environmental flows. And there's a lot of, you know, more than lip service, but not, uh, not that they're going to go an inch further than they need to go, uh, I think would be the, uh, for environmental protections. And so um, this is going to 
create renewed focus because the comments on these components of what will be the foundation for that plan um, should be by the end of July, beginning of August. And as I kind of mentioned to uh, John Ely, the one thing that this plan really does is from the very beginning with the statewide water supply initiative, there was what were called IPPs, identified projects and processes to create more water. Um, things like the PSOP, Preferred Storage Option Program, to enlarge Turquoise Reservoir, and Pueblo Reservoir, and uh, others are one of those IPPs. But they've never been vetted through NEPA, Basin of Origin Impacts, things like that. But they're getting more and more of a mantle of pre-approval through this process. They've just been slowly elevated to people saying, no, they're going to have to be looked at. No, you might not gain as many acre feet from that project as you think you're going to get when you really go through an environmental analysis. And, you know, everyone kind of, oh, okay, yeah, 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 we understand those conditions. But they're really kind of getting a, a golden glow to them that, you know, none of the rest of the plan works unless all the IPPs go forward. So um, th th these forces are just shaping up around us. So just want to reference that back to the board. Anyone who wants to participate on the 24th. And although the basin had gone down to every two month meetings, I think they will be scheduling extra meeting in July to make sure we have strong comments. Thank you, Rachel. Welcome. Okay, anybody else? Seeing none, we had continued our special meeting this morning. So I'll, I'll entertain a motion to go back into exec session again, again for the purpose of uh, finishing up some of the things we didn't get to this morning, the Stewart title litigation, the Thompson Divide gas leases, the bus Ivanhoe litigation, and Windstar, and they're all under CRS 24-6-4024B. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Grassroots, thank you. We'll take about a 10-minute break while Grassroots breaks down. Perfect.